After dealing with the latest batch of customers, Dame Veriling returned to their table. She eyed Fendros and Elise, who were casting some in spices to fill pouches of salt. So, you were saying? This isn't the right place for a formal introduction, Nemel said, but these are two of my classmates from the Imperial Magic Academy. Fendros usually goes by Ray, and the tall one is Elise, who goes by Liz. And now they've been employed by Zusharu, Dame Verilin said. They appear to be noble women, why are they suddenly working at a merchant stand? They're not noble women anymore, Nemel lowered her voice. Their houses were subjected to a tender. They've essentially become outcasts of imperial society. Both Fendros and Elise visibly faltered at her words. Dame Verilin did not shift her attention towards them, though Nemel highly doubted that the Frost Dragon didn't notice how anxious they must be. As your seneschal, Nemel pressed forward, I will require staff. Fendros and Elise, and a third by the name of Ida, are noble women born and raised with an education from the Imperial Magic Academy. Rather than seeing them go to waste here, I recommend that we take them in. Administrative staff of their caliber are not usually something you can pick up off of the street. Is that so? All right then. As Dame Verilin started to walk away, Fendros spun around. Th that's it? An incredulous look broke out from under her calm mask, you're not going to question that at all? Are you not as Miss Gran says you are? We are, but, then what's left is to see how well you perform. Both Fendros and Elise were staring at Dame Verilin now. To make such a major decision uninformed was just as odd to Nemel. The frost dragon in human form turned to regard them quietly. Human simplicity at work again, I suppose, the trace of a smile played over her lips. W what do you mean? Nemel swallowed. The last time Dame Verilin broached the topic of human simplicity, she didn't very much enjoy the outcome. Does being cast out make one any less than what they are? Dame Verilin asked, does it change one in some fundamental way? Deny them something? I do not believe that this is so easy to achieve, so it seems just another way that humans attempt to impose their arbitrary nonsense upon others. It is as if you believe that if you declare a wizard no longer a wizard, they will lose their ability to wield magic. Dame Verilin stepped aside and one of Zushiru's apprentices went by to pick up a few pouches of salt. The frost dragon's turquoise gaze passed over each of them in turn. If you can do as Miss Grand says, then you can. If you can't, then you can't. As for the measure of your character, my liege will be the judge. With that, Dame Verilin wandered back out to speak to the customers gathering in front of the stall. Fendros and Elise finished filling a few more pouches and stepped back from the counter with tired sighs. From their drained appearance, Nemel estimated that they were only two or three spells away from depleting their mana pools. Since you'll be working at the stand, Nemel said, you don't have to empty yourselves out like you used to after school. Hmm, you're right, Elise made a face. Force of habit, maybe? We're used to tapping ourselves out like faucets of spring water. It's fine this time, Fendros said. If our inventory is too sparse, people will think that they're leftovers that no one else wanted for some reason. Maybe some stands were like that, but would it count for industrial salt? Nemel didn't think it would matter so much. You still have to look good for the customers, Nemel said. Tapping out doesn't look so pretty. Their hands went up to lightly touch their faces. Fendros reached down to put a small mirror out of a belt pouch. This is going to be the weirdest horse stand ever, she said as she tried salvaging her appearance. Three noble girls, five rat I mean, Quagua, and one, what is she? Yes, that's right, Elise lowered her voice. When Ray came to get me, the people who weren't watching this stand were turning East Estate upside down looking for the elf that came in with you. That's, that's her, right? Is she using illusion or transmutation school magic to alter her appearance? The way she talks about humans dash she's not one of us, is she? It's not something we should discuss where people might be listening, Nemel told them. If we mess things up for her, she might get angry. Pay attention and you'll figure out what you need to know when it comes to working with her here. Another apprentice appeared to carry the newly filled pouches of salt away. He brought them over to Zushiru, who was neatly lining them up in a wooden case on a newly purchased table. Nemel looked around, wondering if someone was creeping about nearby. Dame Verilin never deviated from the image of a lovely poster girl while she was working at the stand, so there were no cues for Nemel to work with even if the frost dragon detected the presence of a spy. 
She either didn't care at all or understood that what she was doing was utterly overwhelming for any human to keep track of. Instead of trying to hide everything, she simply crushed observers with the sheer volume of information that enveloped her. The notion did nothing to assuage Nemel's fears, however. Her nervousness grew until she led Fentros and Elise inside the tent, casting a silent spell to prevent any of their discussion from leaking out. Two apprentices looked up at them from where they were cleaning some new inventories of ore purchased sometime after they arrived in the city. Elise looked down at them briefly before taking off her gloves and eyeing the spacious interior. It's so warm in here, she closed and opened her fingers. Do you think we can rest inside if we get too cold? I don't think Master Shiru would mind, Nemel replied, as long as you keep it reasonable. The Quagga take turns working inside for the same reason, so if you can find some work of your own to do for the stand in here, it should be alright. The two apprentices turned their attention back to their task, nibbling away at the chunks of stone in their claws. She still wondered whether they were actually being paid to eat. Did Quagoa get fat? Was it even possible to get fat by eating stone? Nemel shook her head, looking back towards Fendros and Elise. At any rate, she said, all of those other people are still out there, so you're in the same position that I'm in now. Maybe worse, you're not members of the army and you've gone out of order by joining us. Count Gramberg's people might even retaliate against you for leaving their group. So make sure you have enough mana to defend yourselves with and counter attempts at magical subterfuge. Fendros put on a thoughtful look, nodding slowly at Nemel's words. As she grew accustomed to their operations, she would probably be far superior to Nemel at dealing with factions that tried to encroach on their position. Should we continue reporting back to the Granberg faction's coordinator? Fendros asked, they know you came in with the elf, these Quagua, and the rest of the people in that caravan but they still haven't figured out which one of them is Frost-19. I thought some of them would have by now. Nemel frowned. Some suspect that it's the elf, or whatever she is, Fendros explained. The human is so flashy that most of them think she's some kind of trap or distraction. We can slowly ease them into the realization. If we do it that way, Granberg's people won't retaliate because they'll think they've managed to position agents on the inside. The longer we lead them on for, Elise said the angrier they'll be when they discover what's happening. Is that safe? We'll be fine, Fendros waved a hand. They aren't expecting us to do anything significant, in fact, they'd rather we didn't since they will want to claim credit for any major breakthroughs. We are all allies and rivals at the same time. For our part, we'll behave as desperate fallen noble women are expected to and offer up morsels of hard-earned information to our handlers now and then. They might try to squeeze us for everything that we're worth but they won't expect much since we're ultimately failures in their eyes. The more I think about it, Elise frowned, the more relieved I feel. That coordinator was starting to get too handsy with us. Sooner or later I'm pretty sure he would have told us that we weren't pulling our own weight and demanded that we join him in his bed if we didn't want to be kicked out. Nemel shuddered. They were probably too valuable to easily discard, but even the suggestion that she would be excluded from the group was intimidating enough for many women to give themselves up especially ones in a desperate situation like Fendros and Elise. Well, he isn't horrible to look upon, Fendros said, and you know as well as I that either of us would happily offer ourselves to a dragon if we thought it necessary. Still, you're right, I would rather not be required to do something like that. Ah, should I tell them? It was probably better not to so they could more naturally settle into their roles. She didn't know how they would react to the fact that they actually had happily offered themselves to a dragon. Being around Dame Verilin more would help soften the blow. What can we tell them, anyway? Elise asked. Slowly crossing off the lists of potential candidates for Frost-19 would be the logical choice, Fendros answered. That's what everyone's still trying to figure out, after all, how long are we going to be in the Empire, by the way? According to what I've been told, Nemel replied, they're doing the whole outer circuit. The whole thing? The golden-haired woman frowned. But that's at least two months, more like three. We'll need more information to dole out if that's the case. Identifying Frost-19 will buy us two weeks, at most. Fendros and Elise hummed. Nemel hadn't reported into any of the army offices at all, maybe she should be offering some breadcrumbs of her own to General Ray. Do you know what she's here for? Fendros asked, everyone's managed to get their hands on the Imperial Air Service filing attached to Frost-19, but it's rather normal looking. That's because it is. 
Not that it appeared to be. Everything normal attached to Dame Verilin ended up being so extraordinary that observers from the Empire couldn't help but imagine that something else was going on. Even after traveling with Dame Verilin for a week, Nemel still couldn't quite believe that things were precisely as stated. Dame Verilin was here to learn about the Empire by participating in a trade circuit with a merchant from the Sorcerer's Kingdom. House Grand's most powerful secret weapon was the realization that genuine conduct was the Empire's greatest weakness. If the Emperor said something like this person is my friend as a purely honest statement, untold fortunes would be expended trying to explore the layers of meaning hidden behind his words. Intrigue was so firmly entrenched into all levels of imperial society that people couldn't help but try to figure out the hidden angles to every action that they observed. The degree to which it affected an individual depended on where they stood and how they were raised, but there was at least a little bit of it in everyone. Dame Verilin and the Quagawa were straightforward people which Nemel liked very much about them. By simply being who they were, however, they immediately aroused suspicion. Imperial citizens just couldn't be satisfied until they had rationalized some sort of truth to everything. That being said, House Grand's weapon wasn't very effective when it came to getting ahead. Her parents were amused to no end whenever a rival tied themselves into knots over nothing, however. It's normal looking because it is, Nemel told them. I think our strategy should revolve around telling people the truth. Fendros and Elise wrinkled their noses in unison. What does that mean? Elise asked. It means what it means, Nemel answered. I don't mean to say that we should lay everything bare for everyone to see, but if anyone asks, you should offer enough of the truth to satisfy. They won't be able to say that you're wrong because that is what they'll also see. And because we're stupid fallen noble women, Fendros tapped her chin lightly. They'll just settle on the idea that we're incompetent and the real truth is something they have to piece together on their own. That's extraordinarily vicious, Nemel. To think that we had a mastermind in our class hiding in plain view the entire time. It must run in the family, Elise added. I always wondered why all of House Grand's rivals just imploded for no apparent reason. Since you're all magic casters, there were some rumors that you conducted dark rituals to curse your enemies. But to think that a minor house could be so terrifying. Nemel wanted to sigh. Attainted or not, these two were imperial aristocrats to the core. Ah, good, you've not gotten to work yet. Nemel, Fendros and Elise all jumped at the sound of Dame Verilin's voice. Apologies, Dame Verilin, Nemel lowered her head, we were just, wait, good? Indeed, Dame Verilin closed the tent flap behind her. Since you have become my minions, there are some basic rules that I would like for you to follow. Rules? Elise said, are there some regulations from the Sorceress Kingdom that we must adhere to? Rather than regulations or laws, I suppose they are more like guidelines or customs. The humans in the southern territories of the Sorceress Kingdom do not appear to have any problems with them. Since you will be, by extension, Lady Zeradnik's subjects, it is probably for the best that you do the same. Fendros and Elise looked over at Nemel, and she shook her head in response. It was the first she had heard of any rules or guidelines. What must we do? Fendros asked, visibly bracing herself. It seems to be common sense to me, Dame Verilin answered, but be sure that you are only doing what you are supposed to be doing. Huh? Nemel furrowed her brow in confusion. Dame Verilin snorted. Silly isn't it? To think humans would require that sort of reminder. To be born with an identity crisis is a terrible thing. And no, Nemel said. I meant we require clarification as to what this means. The frost dragon in human form rolled her eyes, placing a hand on her hip. In the sorceress kingdom, she said, there is a place for everything and it is best for people in their respective places to excel at what they do. That means you should do what you are supposed to be doing. Farmer's farm, smith's smith. Noble's noble. This is not hard to grasp, yes? Humans seem to mostly do this, but sometimes they become deviants. But we're nobles and wizards both, Fendros said. Doesn't that mean we've already strayed beyond this guideline? Nemel is an imperial arcanist, Dame Verilin said. Like that treatise describes. As her classmate, does this not also mean that you are the same? Were they? According to Lady Frian's work, Nemel was almost certainly what was described as an imperial arcanist. Like Nemel, the trio of attainted noble women were in the Academy's magic stream, but they did not come from aristocratic lineages with established arcane traditions. 
So you want us to only do what arcane casters and nobles are supposed to be doing, Elise said. Is that correct? That's right, Dame Verilin nodded. I expect you to put your skills and training as Imperial Arcanists to use, and I also expect you to avoid doing something that you recognize as the work of others. At this stand, for instance, you may do anything that falls within your society's expectations for your role as Imperial Arcanists. Do you understand what this means? They nodded in response to Dame Verilin's question. She bestowed a satisfied look upon them. Good. As a bard, my role in Zushiru's business operations is similar. Humans love to gather around the things that they consider beautiful, so with the four of us here I expect the stand to become quite lively. Master Shiru is already trying to figure out how he can capitalize on this. Nemel watched as Fendros and Elise nodded with determined expressions. Something in the back of her mind told her that Zushiru's humble or stand would not be so humble for much longer. Still, there was nothing to be done about it. They needed to work hard and prove that they were worth keeping to Dame Verilin. The only worry that remained was whether they would survive the judgment of Lady Zaradnik. It was their fourth day in our winter. The winter weather changed little, pale sunlight occasionally broke through heavy clouds that drenched the city in sheets of icy rain. These conditions did not dampen the spirits of the citizens in the first and second class districts, however, they continued to carry themselves with a brisk energy that cut through the biting winds and cold weather. Ludmilla and her friends decided on a change in scenery after three days of shopping in the central market, heading out after a short stop to pick up breakfast at Death Bread. It had become something of a routine, they went to the southern fourth class district every morning before going off to do what they had planned for the day. Hey, are you sure about this? The question came from the opposite corner of the carriage, where Leanne stared absently at their breakfast on the table with a thin-lipped frown. Didn't you encourage us all to pick a couple of places we'd like to see? Ludmilla asked. Yeah, Leanne said, but it's the slave market. Maybe you're curious and all, but I'll tell you right now that the place is absolutely uninteresting. Ludmilla gazed out of her window as their vehicle made its way across our winter's first class district. She didn't choose the slave markets as one of her destinations because she thought that it would be interesting. Leanne knew this as well but her abhorrence of the practice made it so that she persisted in her attempts to dissuade Ludmilla from investigating the system of slavery employed by the Empire. If we choose to only see what pleases us, Ludmilla said, we would be no different than these imperial citizens who blind themselves to the costs of their progress. An incomplete picture will not help us or the Empire, any uninformed actions that we take may only exacerbate its problems. They slowed to a stop in front of an ornate, wrought iron gate. Beyond it was a long avenue that led to a great manor over 200 meters from the estate's entrance. Counting its tall windows of crystal glass, Ludmilla wondered how many halls and chambers the massive three-story building contained. One of their footmen opened the door on her side of the carriage. Lady Freyan entered the carriage, light grey skirts raised in her silk-clad hands. Her complexion had gradually improved as she accompanied them over the past few days and the dark bags under her eyes kept concealed by illusion magic were mostly gone. Good morning, she greeted them with a polite nod. Morning. Behind Lady Frianne, Dimuia boarded with a bright smile. She plopped herself down across the table from Ludmilla, examining the breakfast array before her with a ravenous expression. The door clicked shut and soon after they continued on their way. Turn into a zombie yet, Dimuia? Leanne asked. Nope. Dimmer answered, picking out a lightly frosted apple strudel from the center tray. A priest splashed holy water on me at the temple yesterday when she heard I was eating stuff from death bread, though. My lord father nearly strangled her. Dimmer cut out a huge bite from her pastry and Ludmilla nearly shook her head. After her trip to the Katza Plains, she was certain that randomly tossing holy water at people would be illegal in places with undead citizens. Furthermore, it proved nothing about those affected, almost all undead took damage from holy water regardless of their disposition or intent. Did everyone bring their masks? Lady Frianne asked. Yep as, Leanne held up a simple porcelain mask that would cover her eyes and nose. Why do we need these masks again? Because itchy young noble women commonly go to the slave market. You know, to browse. Don't want to stain our spotless reputations, yeah? Florine shifted slightly at Leanne's silent innuendo. So Dimmer Florine asked. Have you been enjoying Dreams of Red 3? I've read it five times now. 
When do you sleep? Ludmilla furrowed her brow. Ah, uh, I can't remember, Dimmer said. It's just too good. I especially like when Verhoef. Lady Freyan reached up and covered Dimmer mouth. I haven't read it yet, she said. I thought you were trying to make the time for it, but you've already gone through it five times over? Lady Wagner, I'm sure it's clear that it should be my turn, yes? Not till you start calling me Lian. Lian. Dimmer ear made a mournful noise from beneath Lady Freyan's hand. Lian's brutal methods could make even a duke's daughter bend. After putting away Lian's copy of Dreams of Red 3, Lady Freyan took a sip out of her steaming cup of imperial rose tea. After half a week, she still declined offers of breakfast from death bread. I spoke with my lord father about the possibilities that you've presented, she said. Oh? Clara set down her fork, what did Duke Gushmond have to say about them? He refused most of the proposals immediately, Lady Freyan told them. The only suggestion that he appeared to show interest in was the notion that skeletons could be used as laborers in the silver mines. Industries with the worst labor conditions tend to show interest in the undead first, Clara replied with a slow nod, so I suppose it shouldn't be a surprise. I understand that it's only been a few days, but have you checked with the other dukes or any of the more prominent nobles? Duke Vanelland and Duke Wimberg are still away, Lady Freyan smirked. With the impending operations of the Second and Sixth Legions, all of the Margraves are out of the capital to prepare their territories for potential trouble. I've spoken with a handful of counts, but they have so far been unwilling to entertain the use of undead labor. If my family's silver mines show significant success, however, others should begin to express interest. It appeared that they had located one of the cracks in the Empire's defenses that her friends were looking for. According to them, Time and profit would work to widen it until their ideological walls broke apart. How about the new machinery? Lian asked. Ah, about that. Everyone was interested right up to the point where they discovered what was powering everything. If not for that, I'm fairly certain that everyone would have asked for an appointment. I've only covered about a fifth of the first class district but, in the meanwhile, I think I know of someone who won't have any qualms over the use of undead labor. Lian straightened in her seat. Who is it? One of the highest ranking members of the Imperial Ministry of Magic, Lady Freyan said. The head of the ministry has retired from the forefront of the organization, so his lands have been redistributed to his disciples. So these newly enfiefed disciples need labor for their lands? Fluda Paradine's priorities revolved around creating fertile ground for the advancement of arcane magic, Lady Freyan told them. This included helping to establish the foundations of several imperial institutions and guiding the emperors of every generation to create the Baharuth Empire of today. When it comes to domain management or anything like politics or administration, however, he has no personal interest. As such, Seneschals managed these territories on his behalf. Much like fiefs in Reistais, industries that exist on the land are not attached to any specific person or family, but the title. Since the lord of those fiefs was not in any way involved in the operations of his domain, no entanglements arose from the transfer of their titles. The incomes provided by each fief's industries and any derivative businesses simply go from the old lord to the new. Ludmilla turned her gaze out towards the scenery of the first-class district, brow furrowing as Lady Freyan spoke. As she understood it, this was the ideal system of administration that the Baharuth Empire pursued. It was similar to the compartmentalized administrative subdivisions that Ludmilla and Clara had set up in their territories with the Sorcerer's Kingdom's Elder Liches and not too different from how the old system of fiefs functioned in Rhea's ties. The difference in the Empire was that the bureaucrat managing each subdivision was a graduate of the Imperial Magic Academy with all that such an education entailed. There were also questions about whether the bonuses of having a noble serving as head administrator had equivalents in whatever job class these Imperial bureaucrats were. Figuring that part out, however, was difficult since the Empire had far more uncontrolled variables to factor into such an analysis and lacked the exceptional data management of the Sorcerer's Kingdom's administration. What sort of compensation were these disciples provided before this change? Clara asked. They were paid a salary out of the Ministry of Magic's budget, Lady Freyan answered, which is in turn allocated by the Court Council. This is no longer necessary as they now earn revenues from their new titles. Administrative matters of this nature are not my strong point, but is this not a convoluted way to organize things? Leanne and Florine appeared to ponder Ludmilla's question. 
It doesn't sound like these titles are meant to be hereditary, I don't get it. Ah, uh, so they used to receive a salary, but their old boss is out of the picture and, huh? Something wasn't right. Florine took a sip of her tea. All right, so by granting them lands, a salary no longer has to be paid by the Imperial Ministry of Magic. This frees up the Ministry's budget too, no, wait. It is to cultivate loyalty and display recognition. Ludmilla, Leanne and Florine turn their attention to Clara. It is the Emperor bestowing these titles, not the Imperial Administration. This means that the loyalty of those in Fieft goes to the throne rather than the bureaucracy. Not only does the Imperial House use its authority and resources to keep the factions within the Empire in check, but it also ensures that the Imperial Administration and the institutions of the Empire are never in a position to move against the throne should unpopular decisions or reforms be required. More intrigue. Ludmilla released a small sigh. Everything in the Empire seemed to revolve around political authority, influence and power. It was a very different sort of absolute monarchy than that of the Sorceress Kingdom, one whose absolute authority needed to be constantly maintained lest it be lost to internal strife. By contrast, the Sorceress Kingdom was ruled by a god. Its citizens could act with a certainty that stemmed from his absolute existence. Out of curiosity, Ludmilla asked. How are the Imperial Knights compensated? I don't believe they are granted fiefs like conventional knights. They are paid a salary like most officials in any government department, Lady Freyan replied. These salaries are according to rank, of course. As the Imperial Army answers directly to His Imperial Majesty, the Imperial Army's budget is derived from taxes and the Crown's other avenues. Are new nobles ever promoted out of its ranks? Those who distinguish themselves are promoted if their achievements are significant enough. Many high-ranking officers in the Imperial Army are non-inheriting martial nobles who are granted lands of their own due to their martial excellence, but there are sometimes cases where commoners are promoted. Lord Peshmal is probably the most well-known example of this, he was originally a dock worker from one of the cities on the Strand. Now, he's a great Imperial Knight and Count Paladine of the Empire. Lord Peshmal's arrangement is similar to these disciples in the Imperial Ministry of Magic. Though his rank and title are higher, Lady Freyan nodded, it effectively is. He similarly cares little for administration or politics, his lands are simply a source of income to him. The man is as common as he was the day he assumed his office, it's quite infuriating for many members of the aristocracy to deal with. Is that a good thing, or a bad thing? Lady Freyan's lip twitched slightly. Depending on the circumstances, she said, it can be quite amusing especially when certain ambitious nobles attempt to draw him into their games of intrigue. Other times, I wish I could strangle him. Since the great imperial knights are first and foremost concerned with the protection of the emperor, however, his conduct rarely results in issues when performing public duties. I see, Ludmilla said. I suppose the relationship between members of the Ministry of Magic and the Empire's aristocracy is somewhat similar. Their conduct would be considered stereotypical for wizards. Yes, Lady Freyan said. The individual I mentioned has a different arrangement from the others, however. Baroness Neuer requested a county-sized expanse of undesirable and mostly undeveloped crown land, which His Imperial Majesty was more than happy to grant. As with nearly all of the Ministry of Magic's best and brightest she's quite the eccentric, but it also means that she has no qualms about employing the undead if they provide tangible benefits. Will she be at the Ministry of Magic when we drop by? Leanne asked. Baroness Neuer is a researcher, Lady Freyan answered, and she rarely leaves her work. We should be able to find her in her laboratory while we're there, and she'll probably be more than happy to show you what she's been working on. Those who display interest in her research may not be able to easily peel her off of them, so you may wish to keep that in mind. The carriage stopped at the opposite gate of the first-class district, undergoing a brief inspection before being waved through. As the road curved gently down the hillside, they were offered a commanding view of our winter's northern sprawl. Beyond the cultivated fields outside of the walls, the mountains north of the capital could be seen crossing the horizon. Was there some specific reason you wanted to see the slave market, Lady Zaradnik? Ludmilla turned her attention from the window to answer Lady Freyan's question. Slavery is illegal in the Sorceress Kingdom, she said. As was it in Ria's ties. 
I've personally seen the conditions and effects associated with illegal slavery early in the transitionary stages of e-rental, so I find it difficult to imagine what slavery in the empire is like to have it remain an institution of one of the sorcerous kingdom's client states. I see, you are aware of the imperial reforms brought about thirty years ago? I am, Ludmilla replied. Even so, the idea bothers me. It is something I must see for myself. Lady Freyan studied her quietly from behind an unreadable mask. I cannot speak for what you've observed elsewhere, she said after several moments, but I believe that you will find slavery in the Empire very much unlike what you would witness in other nations. Their carriage approached a large building complex dominating the northeast and second class district. The area that it occupied exceeded many of the government complexes in the first class district. Is this the slave market? Florine cast a subdued look out of her window, it's a lot bigger than I thought it would be. It has to be this large, Lady Freyan said. Slaves are not the same as the merchandise that one puts on a shelf or in a crate, they require accommodations and various facilities to support them. I've heard from my grandmother that this place was far different back before the reforms to imperial slave laws. What you see before you was brought about by the new legal requirements introduced by the previous emperor. Before they finished rolling up to the entrance, Lady Freyan donned her mask. She indicated that the others should as well. Is it just me? Leanne said, or does wearing these make our visit seem even more scandalous? The masks are mostly employed to prevent casual identification and observation, Lady Freyan said as the carriage came to a stop. Dimmer will be leading us around for this, so those within who are aware of her association with our party will still be reporting our movements. Why Dimmer Ludmilla asked. It would be, improper for a duke's daughter to be officially recognized here. Merchants representing specific interests usually perform most of the transactions in the slave market, but a noble arriving to make personal purchases is not unheard of. Dim Ears house is of the appropriate social rank to allow us free movement while also avoiding too much attention. Across from Lud Miller, Dim Ear wiggled on a signet ring. She flexed her fingers several times and adjusted her mask before stepping out of the carriage. The entrance to the slave market was an open archway leading to a network of promenades laid between the different buildings of the complex. Though referred to as the slave market, it appeared to be a multitude of independent establishments sharing the same location. Dim Ear led them through the archway, and the guards gave the barest glance at the ring on her hand before turning their attention elsewhere. Looks like young ladies coming to visit is pretty common. They've got that inspection down to a routine. Ludmilla released a quiet sigh at Leanne's comment, but she couldn't refute the observation. The rules, culture and conduct of our winter's citizens were far too complex for her liking and she could not adapt as quickly as her friends. Is seeing that signet ring really enough to dictate so much? Sure is. In the imperial capital, knowing who's who is a basic part of the people's working knowledge. Understanding precedence and social order both keeps you alive and gets you ahead. Everything about you is weighed and measured at a glance and your treatment from that point onward can only be changed by new information that drastically changes the running perception. Even after several days, the entire experience still felt like she was walking around a place filled with undetectable traps. Hopefully, the character of Warden's Veil wouldn't warp in such a manner. Was there something in particular you wanted to see? Dimmer asked. My expectations coming in weren't exactly those that inspired anticipation, Ludmilla answered. A sample of everything, perhaps? Hmm, okay. Normally, people have an establishment selected in advance and head straight there. It's rare for people to shop around in the slave market, but it's not against any rules. They turned a corner, heading into a more crowded area of the markets. Dimitri stopped outside what looked like a larger store. A well-dressed female merchant wandered around the floor, occasionally pausing to speak with the well-dressed men and women browsing the aisles. Rows of plainly clothed individuals beside signs with various details written upon them seemed to be sizing up everyone that passed. This one's a place for clerks, accountants, scribes and such, Dimmer said. The desk over there is for prospective clients who want to test a slave's skills. Those are all decently paying professions, Ludmilla said. How did they end up here? Hmm. Dim Ea rubbed her jaw, how do I put it, you know how apprentices agree upon terms of indenture when signing up to train under a master artisan. Yes. It's kind of like that. 
Most citizens of the empire who are sold into slavery are consensual indentures. Some even call it a second apprenticeship. They fall into debt or need a large sum of money right away, so they sign contracts with merchants who in turn sell indentures to the clients here. Those confident in their skills even use these indentures as a way to secure upfront capital for their own ventures. They lose their citizenship while they're slaves, but once they fulfill their contracts they get it back. As Dimitri spoke, Lady Freyan fell into step closer to Ludmilla. Unlike those in rural vocations who have the option of negotiating tenancy or migrating to lands where expansion creates demand for their skills, she said. Urban professionals like the ones you see are subject to the strict regulation of the guilds, which are extremely restrictive on economic mobility. The simplest recourse is indenture in nations where it has not been outlawed. The empire's slavery reforms were enacted in order to secure the rights of imperial slaves and eliminate forms of slavery unproductive for the nation as a whole. Ludmilla mulled over their case as Dimitri led them deeper into the markets. Artisans appeared to be organized by profession over the floor, displayed in specialized stores. Some stood behind samples of their work. Leanne stopped to pick up an iron gear, examining it with a critical eye. Ludmilla cast a critical eye of her own towards Leanne. You're not buying him. I'm just checking out his skills. That merchant over there is coming for you now. Liang carefully set down the gear and scurried off. They reached the end of the section, where a number of culinary artisans were preparing large amounts of food. Are they slaves? Florine asked, or are they working here? Both, Dimitri answered. Why not, right? The slaves being sold here live on the premises and must be provided for until a sale is made. It's part of the contract that they sign with the merchants who do their best to mitigate the cost of accommodating their inventories. The living conditions of these slaves have to meet the standards of well-being set by imperial law. Imperial law, huh? Citizens of the empire could become slaves. Since they became slaves under imperial law, they had to be safely returned to life as imperial citizens upon the fulfillment of their contract. As such, it was illegal to unjustly punish or otherwise abuse them. Physical abuse, criminal negligence and murder of imperial slaves would be judged as if the victim was an imperial citizen. I have a fair idea of what this part of the market offers, Ludmilla said. Let's head on to the next. Sure thing. They went back the way they came, past the tidy market sections and bustle of activity. That the most prevalent odor in the air was simply that of lunch being prepared was a stark contrast to what she had expected after witnessing the chattel slavery of Rhea's ties. How are imperial slave laws enforced? Ludmilla asked as they returned to the main intersection of the slave market. Breaches of law result in fines, Lady Freyan said. Imperial slaves may report their masters to the authorities. Generally speaking, one does not damage or otherwise negatively influence their property since they are purchased for productive purposes. Well, they can but it would be highly impractical and, in the case of slaves, would be performing a criminal act. Meaning to say that the wealthy can effectively pay to abuse their slaves if so inclined? Lady Freyan fell silent for a dozen steps. This is an unfortunate possibility, yes. Repeat offenses are of course factored into prosecution. Those wealthy enough to do this tend to be nobles, however, so such instances are minimized. How so? because there have been several cases where breaches of imperial slave laws were used as justification for attainder. This sort of outcome is especially popular with the common folk, so his imperial majesty is more than happy to act if so inclined. The guards at the entrance of the western market seemed to exchange knowing glances as they passed between them. It wasn't long until they saw why. Can we turn around now? It'll be a good reference, Miss Dreamer. Arg. Did you see those looks the guards exchanged? They think we're here to, too, dd did they dip that man in oil? The man noted Florine's wide-eyed gaze, striking a pose and winking at her. Florine turned her face in the opposite direction, which didn't solve anything since there were barely dressed men everywhere. Ludmilla wondered what would happen if she struck her flint near one of them. Dimitri cleared her throat. As you can see, she said, this section is for muscle. The establishments with the less flashy guys are selling laborers. These ones we're passing by right now are loosely considered battle slaves, though they aren't the same sort you might have found a generation or two ago. From least to most expensive, you have laborers, those suited for private security, and those skilled enough to be personal bodyguards. 
Those with extraordinary martial skill can go to the arena and can rack up earnings. Doesn't that count as abuse? Florine asked. The arena environment entails a certain amount of risk, Lady Freyan said, but the terms of their indenture come with special clauses. One cannot simply use imperial slaves as fodder in the arena or as expendable soldiers. If viewed from a simplistic standpoint, it is not much different than commissioning an adventurer for a long-term contract. Costs for accommodations, equipment, training and treatment of injuries are shouldered by the slave's owner, so it is often viewed as an attractive avenue for those who are confident enough to risk themselves in combat but do not possess the required capital to begin their careers. It seems to be all men, Ludmilla noted. It's all men on display, yeah, Dimitia nodded. In truth, women sold in this section are just super high demand. Well-to-do women tend to want at least a few women as personal bodyguards, but most aren't wealthy enough to entice former adventurers, workers or imperial knights into their service. Strong and attractive female bodyguards are all the rage amongst men and beautiful women who can compete in the arena become fan favorites. Since women are already more scarce than men in this department, it inevitably gets like this. Ludmilla stopped to examine one of the men along the way. He was about 10 centimeters shorter than she was, with black hair and dark olive skin. A pair of dark brown eyes examined her in return. You're not buying him. I was just trying to figure out what he was. You have a good eye, miss. A tall merchant who looked every bit as muscular as the men on display spoke as he approached them. Ludmilla turned her attention to the merchant. Do I? The merchant stopped in his tracks. That's, um, indeed. He's a rare import from across the Great Steppe. It seems like quite the distance to transport a slave, Ludmilla said. Is he truly worth the cost? Truly, miss, truly, the merchant smiled. Most of our combat slave inventory comes from the city-state alliance. It's truly rare that we get one from the world beyond. He is young and strong and handsome, eh? Ludmilla turned to examine the slave again. He appeared to be about as strong as one of the Sorceress Kingdom's platinum-ranked adventurers, which was especially confusing. How did someone who could easily make his way in the world end up as a slave? Seriously, Ludmilla, you're not buying him. I wasn't considering it. There are many things that don't make sense with this one. How long have you had him for? Leanne asked. He came with a caravan that arrived just before the winter. And how long do you expect he'll be around for? Hmm, not long, I think, the merchant replied with a calculating look. The arena has already expressed a keen interest in this one. That so? Well, no point in competing with the grand arena. Guess we'll see what he's made of there. The merchant lowered his head. Leanne walked past him and Dimitia went to catch up with her. They strolled around the battle slave area, though Ludmilla saw little else of note amongst the slaves who attempted to appeal to them as they walked past. Was that guy really that great? I mean he has the exotic look and all, but... He was about as strong as a platinum rank. What? Maybe we should buy. We're not buying him. I was more interested in where he came from and what he might know about the world across the Great Steppe. More accurately, Ludmilla was curious about a human from lands beyond where humans were supposed to exist. Well, we know where he's probably going to end up so maybe something like an interview can be set up whenever he gets there. Back at the main intersection, Dimitia turned to face them with a tentative look. Um, about this next part. What's wrong? Clara asked. It's the section for personal slaves if you know what I mean. Everyone turned their gazes at Ludmilla. I don't see why we should stop, she said. They advanced down the promenade towards a large building at the end. For the first time, the guards seemed about to stop them. Dimitia did not slow, however, instead holding her head high as she led them inside. The lighting of the interior was dim, though the immediate surroundings should have been covered by the dark vision items that her friends possessed. Over the floor, the establishment's dividers were distinctly different from the other two sections, providing what Ludmilla assumed was supposed to be a more exclusive atmosphere. Unlike the area with indentured professionals who were plainly attired and battle slaves adorned to exhibit their strength, the slaves here were all naked or close to it. Leanne and Florin went rigid as they passed men and women who openly flaunted themselves as they drew close. Awkward. Didn't you two come here to find consorts? Not here. And there's an order to things, you know? 
It wasn't long until a merchant intercepted their party. She glanced over them until her eyes found the signet ring on Dimaia's finger. Welcome, she lowered her head with a smile. How may I assist you? I'm just showing my friends around, Dimaia replied. Of course. If you come across anyone that piques your interest, please don't hesitate to ask. They continued strolling down the aisles, and the woman shadowed them from several meters. Ludmilla quickly noted a reversal from the area with the battle slaves. The vast majority of the people here are women, she said. They also seem quite brazen. It is a common strategy, the merchant replied. A strategy? Ludmilla tried to keep the incredulity out of her voice. Most of the women you see here are those who are confident in their appearance, the merchant told her. Those who can afford to purchase the types of slaves sold in this establishment possess significant wealth. Attracting such a master would offer a life of luxury far beyond what the average citizen can ever obtain. It felt as if every time her opinion of the empire rose a bit, she came across something that smacked it straight back down. As they proceeded to the furthest reaches of the hall, Ludmilla's expression grew grim. An elf stood in a booth around the corner. Florian gasped quietly. H his ears, why? Apologies if this disturbs you, miss, a woman in merchant's attire nearby said. They were already like this upon their arrival in the empire. In a few spots along the hall, similarly maimed elves languished in their displays. Their long ears had been cut in half as if someone had decided they shouldn't be any longer than a human's. Where are they from? Florian's voice trembled slightly. They are prisoners of war taken from the great forest of Evansa, the merchant answered. People from the theocracy find Elvenir's repulsive, so they are, modified to increase their value to prospective owners. We haven't received a new shipment since the spring, so prices have risen sharply. Why they hadn't received new shipments was no mystery, the sorcerer's kingdom lay on the trade route between the slain theocracy and the Baharuth Empire, and Clara did not allow a single shred of contraband over the border. How much are they? Florine asked. The merchant listed the sums for the elves on display. They were dozens of times more expensive than the slaves in the other two sections. A young female druid with emerald eyes and golden hair appeared to be the premier piece on display, she was several hundred times the price of an indentured artisan. Ludmilla could probably charter two or three dozen of her fortified farming villages with the same sum. Florine's hand went to her infinite haversack. Ludmilla narrowed her eyes. You're not buying them. Ludmilla. This is so wrong. We have to do something. Slavery is illegal in the sorceress kingdom. Then I'll just let them go. They can be free. You heard this woman, they were taken in war and sold as slaves after their ears were chopped off. They're nothing at all like these other people. So you intend to right every wrong by opening your coffers? We don't even know how that war started or the circumstances behind their capture. The world has plenty of wrongs to sell you, Florine. More merchandise can be readily procured to appeal to your sensibilities. Florian bit her lip with a tearful look. Ludmilla is right. Clara. You're the last person that, if you plan on saving people, you must make sure to do it properly. Purchasing slaves as a noble of the sorceress kingdom is unacceptable and simply setting these elves free does them no favors in the empire. I can't even save the people suffering right in front of my eyes? You've already stopped the flow of slaves from the theocracy. These must be the last few. I only control the route through my territory. There are other routes to the empire and paying these prices makes those routes viable. Furthermore, it may make other sources viable. Throwing money at slave traders only incentivizes the slave trade. It is possible to save these slaves by purchasing them, but you will also bring suffering to a thousand more. A permanent, effective solution is required to achieve what you desire. With a frustrated sigh, Florine stormed off. Leanne hurried to join her, followed by Dimaia. Ludmilla turned to address the merchant. Out of curiosity, Ludmilla said, Why do these elf slaves command such a high price? Because they are foreign slaves, the merchant replied. I see. Imperial citizens who became slaves were protected by imperial law. Foreign slaves, however, were not. It did not matter if they were humans, elves or any other race. Masters of such slaves were free to do as they pleased and would pay exorbitant amounts to purchase that right. Ludmilla stalked off after Florine, Leanne, and Demaia. She had seen enough.